The Singapore story is an inspiring one of an accidental nation that survived and thrived against insurmountable odds. But behind the Singapore story are the personal stories of Singaporeans. People who embodied the spirit, sacrifice, and successes of the time. The story unfolds in the 1960s, the decade when determination would triumph over uncertainty. It was the 1960s, and Singapore was a city with a buzz. Flashy cars. A hip music scene. And even its own Olympic hero. It was also big on motorsports. In the 60s, um, Singaporean loves to watch uh, motor racing, especially motorcycles and uh, the thrill and spills they can see, you know. So they found it very uh, exciting and they were strong there. The inaugural Singapore Grand Prix in 1961 was the first international motorsporting event to feature both car and motorbike races. But not just anyone could play. Motorsport wasn't that easy in a sense, because in the early days, it was kind of a cliquish game. The British Armed Forces, those were the people who, who brought motor racing, organized the sport, you know, they brought motorsport into Singapore. And uh, so it's like, it's their world. For example, if we want to overtake a European competitor, he will swerve left and right to block you down the straight. Right? This is like playing a dangerous game because they don't like to lose to a local. It's visit the Orient here, and many tourists are already arriving by sea, land, and air. By the end of this year, we expect 150,000 visitors from all over the world. The Grand Prix was part of a regional Visit the Orient Year tourism campaign, and it attracted international speedsters from Asia and Europe eager to take the checkered flag and the fame and fortune that came with it. William Liu was then a teenager obsessed with car engines. But little did he imagine he'd one day be behind the wheel, zooming around a racetrack. I was a student, so I didn't have the funds to buy a car. But what I did was I had my skills in refining a car's engine performance and recovering the efficiency, potential efficiency from it. And after that, uh, it impressed my friend Tony, who owns the car. Then we were having street racing in town to prove the modification works. From there, we sort of uh, springboard into motorsport. In the Grand Prix's second year, the event was renamed the Malaysian Grand Prix in anticipation of Singapore's impending merger with its northern neighbor. In the next few months, we shall settle the constitutional arrangements for merger. But by 1965, while the merger ran into engine trouble, the interest in motorsports in Singapore had grown. The 1966 installment of this annual event was once again called the Singapore Grand Prix. 
and it would run under this banner until 1973. William had less money and far less experience compared to his foreign rivals. But the local boy never let all that slow him down. William, in his mighty little Mini Cooper, took on all comers, showing his countrymen where the drive of a true champion came from. William's drive defined the can-do spirit of the 60s. Motor racing is a sport where you must have the drive, your inner drive, that you know you want to play in the sport. The inner drive wasn't just good for propelling cars round a racetrack. It was also helping to make waves in another sport. In 1965, Singapore was made an independent nation. It was an interesting time for not just the country, but for all of us. Barely months after declaring independence, Singapore's athletes were competing in the 1965 Southeast Asian Peninsular Games, Singapore's first regional sporting event as a new nation. I grew up as part of Malaysia until 1965. What was interesting was that suddenly you became aware that you had to uh, become Singaporean. As newly independent Singapore was finding its feet on the world stage, 11-year-old Patricia Chan was getting herself and the Republic noticed in the pool. We were actually competing as a new country in the very same country that threw us out, so to speak, you know. For me, it wasn't lost on any one of us, young though we may have been. But it was quite clear there was, uh, there was a new flag to represent, there were new colours to, to to uh, fly, and also a sense of, well, look, we, this is what we can do. You know, this is who we are. Patricia won each of the eight events she competed in. It was a sort of a very quiet sort of pride that certainly we made them stand up eight times <laughs> to listen to our national anthem, Singapore national anthem. Uh, and, and yes, I think we established ourselves then as, as a, a swimming nation. This began a winning streak for Patricia Chan. Victories that came because she trained long and hard and with single-minded focus. Her eyes always on the prize. Her journey into the annals of local sporting history mirrored Singapore's own arduous journey to becoming a nation. National identities have always been something that you forge through hardship, through pain, through self-discovery, and that's a journey in itself, not unlike a personal identity, not unlike at all. I mean, you could spend an entire life trying to find out who you are. For Singapore, forging an identity and finding stability, security, and success was not going to come easy. It meant sailing through violent, stormy seas. The important thing about history is to remember the good and the bad, because you have to believe that people are smart enough to sort out. I remember very much this when, when I turned 17 and my father gave me the key to the house and I looked at him and I said, wow, you, you trust me, dad? And he said, 
I trust the way I brought you up. And I think at some point, we must do that, you know, to trust the way we have brought up Singaporeans, that you are smart, that you will know good stuff from the bad. We have stumbled and fallen a lot of times. We learn to pick ourselves up and we learn to continue. Being thrown into the deep end presented opportunities to learn and grow. My uncle literally threw me into the swimming pool. Deep end, mind you. That's how I learned to swim, I was seven. Tough love is a good thing. And I think life was a lot tougher then anyway. William Ho had his share of tough love too. He spent his youth working on his dad's quail and poultry farm. Today, William runs the business. My dad is my mentor, and um, he trained me not like, this, like his son. He trained me like an apprentice. So even though I'm his son, I went down to the bottom, to the ground. So my first job was digging manure. The reward comes in a few days later when some senior uncle from other farms comes to me and says, oh, young man, how much is a bag of your manure? So I just raise up my hand, I say, but in my heart, I say, okay, la, 50 cents, you can have it. La. But I didn't, I, luckily, I didn't voice up. Then the, the senior, the uncle says, okay, $5 a bag, fair enough. I say, uncle, what do you say? $5. Wow. Back then, $5 is big, is big money. William's father, Ho Seng Chun, was one of Singapore's pioneer commercial farmers. In the early 60s, farming was one of the government's top priorities. In the early years of independence, 1965-66, um, farming is the name of the game because um, it's a young country, so we, the basics that we need is food. So the government actually, main priority is to provide food for the people of Singapore so that uh, we will be self-sustainable. And, and we did, we, our farming is so sustainable that we got surplus to sell back to our neighbor country. And because of the support, farm in Singapore grew in size from backyard they grow into medium, into even large-scale farming. After a trip to Japan he paid for himself, William's father introduced new poultry-rearing innovations. Battery cages replaced free-range plots, along with factory-style housing for egg-laying hens. Ho Sr. wasn't just enterprising, he was also big on community and giving back a trait that William says was reflective of the times. What his father gave to Singapore's farming community was a self-published farming manual. Farming methods, farming equipment, uh, this husbandry uh, management, uh, then diseases, uh, knowledge and all these things. Uh. So it's all in the, the, the journal. Then of course, this journal is uh, um, out of his own pocket and that's a way he actually gave back to the community. Uh, life is much more simpler, okay? Well, it's not so complicated or sophisticated. So um, the, the community is like, you know, the kampong spirit. You know, you help me scratch my back, I help you scratch your back. As the whir of industry propelled the young country forward, there was another 60s sound that got Singaporeans moving. It was the sound of music. Orchard Road was not the shopping belt that it is today. 
Orchard Road with a whole lot of sprinkling of uh, live music, if you think of it. You go to Orange Grove Road. That would be the original Orchard Hotel. You have a restaurant run by the hotel called the uh, Golden Venus. You go down to the Lido. There'd be a place called the Rosé Door, which was also basically a dinner dance club. And across the road, you'd have the Tropicana. You go down the road, you get the Princess Hotel Garni. And obviously, you had Raffles Hotel. Singapore had its own version of the swinging 60s with a vibrant live music scene. The popularity of live shows meant a career in music wasn't such a far-fetched dream. But breaking into the business did take persistence and guts, as local music veteran Horace Wee found out. What you did was you try in all ways and means to get yourself known. That means you try to play in whatever jab sessions there are. You also go up and uh, have the gall to go and ask the band leader, excuse me, sir, can I sit in with your band, right? And uh, the old musicians were crafty devils, right? They would say, oh, okay, let's see how you play it. Musicians in the 60s didn't have swinging lifestyles. Most did it for the love of making music and in the hope that they'd be discovered. And of course, if you get well known in the club circuit, somebody higher up might notice you, right? In this case, somebody in broadcasting for the radio orchestra might say, hey, you know, I could use somebody like that and you would get an opportunity maybe to audition for, a, for a broadcasting, right? Which is essentially what happened to me. Horace's gig with Radio Television Singapore would eventually lead him to work in the recording industry. Horace is one of the lucky ones. Most other players in the circuit had much leaner gigs. Music is art, and if you do not play from your heart, you're not saying anything. We have had musicians that put their instruments in the pawn shop, and when you call them for a job, they say, excuse me, I need an advance in the payment. Why? Because you've got to buy, bring, redeem the instruments out of the, the pawn shop in order for them to play the gig, right? Nowadays, we have so much exposure to different choices of media. But uh, in those days, even before the advent of television, all you had was radio. Radio Fusion was actually more the leader of uh, popular music. They would be probably spinning the popular songs of that day, right? Uh, from the 50s, 60s, whatever was the top hit. If you wanted to listen to anything more, you would get a radio, shortwave radio. You get a shortwave radio and you tune into BBC and they'd have the weekly Top of the Pop. Top amongst the pop stars in 1964 was a little band from Liverpool. That same year, the Beatles and Beatlemania came to town. But amidst the frenzy for the Fab Four, a Singaporean band was about to have a David and Goliath moment. Another four boys from the Tiong Bahru neighborhood in Singapore knocked the Beatles off the number one spot in the local charts. The band was called The Quests, and they were a bunch of untrained, self-taught teenage musicians. We played with non-musical instruments, you know, biscuit tins, school bag to represent snare drum and kick drum. And we played along records. So that's where we begin to develop a very deep sense of musical rhythm. We won on huge talent time and uh, we were spotted by the then RTS Radio Television Singapore and they, they got us to appear on some of the programs. We were being called back again and again and again, yeah. 
Not that the pay was very good as usual, <laughs> but we were happy as young lads. Teenagers, 17, 18 years old, or even earlier, maybe 15, appearing on TV, national TV, you know, you know something. People are happy to appear on national TV. We had to play as it comes. No room for mistake because it was telecast live. No room for technical issue. No, not supposed to have any problem with the cables or the sound amplifier. Live. And we did. We did it. But as swinging as the 60s were in Singapore, it was still a conservative Asian society. And these conservatives were always watching. Our guitarist, Reggie, he tried to put on a pair of sunglasses in front of the TV, but was told to not to do it. Why? Because, well, sunglasses means gangsterism. Either you take it off or you don't go on to the show. Gangsterism, drugs, pornography, outlandish attire. In fact, anything conservatives considered decadent were condemned. This was Singapore's anti-yellow culture movement. Mass media channels like TV were strictly monitored for any violations. In those days, the perception of a musician is somebody who's a classical musician. Yeah, either it be a concert violinist, concert pianist, concert harpies, or play in orchestra, then you're a musician. If you carry a guitar, well, the best you could do is go and play under the coconut tree. Reggie's father, very funny, guitars are for gangsters, is what he says. Again, the perception, is, 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 you, 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 whether you like it or don't like it, but it is the view of the society. For a young country set adrift in uncertainty, sports and the arts weren't pressing priorities. Many talent are being suppressed, not only in arts, like performing arts, drawing, poetry, and so on. Also in sports, swimming, athletic, and so on. The government was busy in shaping the society, and they have very much neglected these two areas, arts and sports, and that's still my stand today. So those who made it against the odds, people like swimmer Patricia Chan and musician Henry Chua became local heroes. In November 1964, one of the Quest's original compositions, Shanti, launched the band into regional stardom by knocking the Beatles off the top of the charts. For many growing up in the era, the popular anthem captured the spirit of the times, but the mood of the 60s weren't always upbeat. Like on the 10th of March, 1965, a day forever etched in Henry Chua's memory. In my studio, as you know, is on the fourth floor of McDonald House in Orchard Road, which is still there. At the ground floor is a bank. On that day, we were not supposed to have a recording because it was cancelled. And fortunately so. Because on that particular day, a, a very, very powerful bomb went off. This bomb was hidden on the staircase of the front lobby, where the two elevators are. Had we been there, we would probably be at the front of the building and probably got hit as well. The bombing was the result of the Indonesian government's opposition to the formation of the Malaysian Federation, of which Singapore was a part. The conflict was called Konfrontasi. It triggered a series of alarming events. 
threaten peace in Singapore and heighten Singaporeans' awareness of the political precariousness surrounding them. The McDonald's building bombing, I remember, because the SGI is near, not too far from there, right? Uh, so I, I remember the incident that happened. One of the bombers was sentenced to death, and as school kids, you know, living around the, living around uh, well, SGI and so on, we decided to go and listen to the court case. Francis Pavri moved to Singapore with his family in the early 1950s. He grew up with Singapore in the decades that followed and braved the storms that came, both metaphorically and literally. What happened is the flood water just came and came and came, and there was very little we could do. So the water came into the house, flooded up to about ankle deep. So everything on the floor had to be lifted to the bed. Of course, as kids, you know, water running around, we were very happy, you know, just playing with the water and so on. But it was the aftermath that was an issue because, as you know, when floods come in, they leave a lot of silt, mud and so on. So after the floods receded, my gosh, I tell you, the whole house, you know, was filled with silt all over the place. So we had to clean and clean and clean. And I think it was months before we actually got rid of of, of, of everything, you know. So that's, I think, marks the society then, you know. People did what they needed to do, and if things happened, they solved the problems and continue with life. The floods came and went, but nothing could douse the fire that fueled rapid growth. Economic growth was, what, 10, 12? even sometimes double digit, you know. So this is a rising tide, and they say a rising tide uh, floats up all boats. So everybody was in this. For my generation, having lived a life that has seen tremendous improvement, we are also extremely grateful. Let me give you an example. Four of us lived in one room, right, along this corridor. That's one room, four persons. And the progress has been remarkable. Now I am living with one person with four rooms. <laughs> That's the contrast that I can give to see how well Singapore improved. And largely, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Probably the one with the cleanest shirt. The one? Yeah. That's correct. That's me. Go down. Francis, today a retired lecturer, volunteers at the Singapore Science Center. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah. 81 to 90, is that you? No. <laughs> so there's been tremendous progress because of the drive towards competition, meritocracy, and that competition and that kind of life has given us all this wonderful progress. And that's where the irony comes in. And the irony is that we want a slower life, we want to be contented, we want to have more compassion. But these are the qualities that if we had considered would not give us the economic progress we have today. So how do you reconcile that? It's an often used cliche that success is a journey, not a destination. Well, for women in Singapore, in the still conservative 60s, taking that journey off the beaten path was not quite a done thing. Those days, a lot of jobs, they say, oh, your woman cannot do it. But just for a while, then they, they proved that we also can do whatever they do. The 60s were hip. The 60s were hippie. The 60s were also a tiny hip hip hooray for women in Singapore. By then, they had cast their first vote in nationwide elections, had their rights protected by law under the Women's Charter, and housework was no longer the only kind of work they were recognized for. 
yes, those days, a lot of jobs, they say, oh, your woman cannot do it. But just for a while, then they, they prove that we also can do whatever they do. 76-year-old Evelyn Wong is a former cop. She joined the police force in 1963 when she was only 18. At a time when it wasn't common for a woman to have a career, let alone one as a crime fighter, this was a big deal. My family, uh, in fact, my parents are okay, but only certain relatives just to comment, uh, tell my mother, why you let your da daughter go and join police? Uh, this type of job not suitable for women and the kind of things. Uh. So also uh, my sister-in-law also tell, tell my mother she can go. Uh, she, I think uh, two weeks only uh, she will cry and come back. Uh. Actually, those days we find a job, we're very happy already. So we don't bother what people say. Our training is very tough and tight at the time. We've got no time to think of whether to leave or to continue or what. Evelyn stuck with it for more than 30 years. One of her most memorable assignments was going undercover, gun and handbag, to protect her former high school principal who had received death threats. Scary, but for Evelyn, just another day on the job. No time to scare. No, no time to scare to tell you to go, go. That's it. That's got her a bit, a bit fear, la, but you've got no choice la, because it's your duty, you have to protect her. Another thing is like, because you feel that, you feel very proud because, wow, I've chosen to be a security officer to somebody, you know, to, your, to your own principal. La. For this job, I also went to a special training for shooting. La. So, so that's how I, I become a mass woman. Now. They learn everything the men police do. Here they are identifying such things as opium implements, which they may come across in the course of their duty. We learn how to do multitask. We learn a lot of language. And also we can solve problems for people, can help people. If I given a chance to come back if I'm younger, I don't mind. I always tell people I don't mind to join back again because Whatever we go through, whatever we go through in the police force, it's not everybody can get that kind of experience. Evelyn's life as a cop began with nine months of intensive training at the police academy. Man or woman, you went through the same drills. It's the same. We have, what they go through, we have to go through. What the instructors say, we have to follow that kind. Of, very strict. Cannot question. You question me, they will shout at you, you go and run, do round, come back. No question. But all that tough training still didn't entirely prepare you for the rough and tumble of the streets. Gangsters extorted money from businesses, including coffee shops and street hawkers, and most paid up. There's no choice because they have to live. If you don't pay, they will destroy your things. Uh, so these are the life, those are the 60s, uh, uh, what, what the Singaporean uh, face. Uh. Yeah, the environment is very complicated and a lot of gangsters walking around to, to collect those uh, powerful fae. Yeah. So you need to know someone that uh, in, the, in the gangster background to protect you. Normally they will settle by themselves, la. they won't go to the, to the police. La. Tan Siak Che's father and grandfather were both street hawkers in the 60s. They sold fried kuei tiao and fishball noodles at the Juchiet Street Market. Gangsters often showed up to extort their hard-earned money, but these thugs didn't always get their way. He refused to pay. Uh, so he just tried to fight back. So after that, uh, the neighbor that uh, there also will help him also. La. And because my father got quite a lot of friends there, uh, so the gangster also, after that, don't dare to come, come back again. Last time, they, all the neighbor so wang siang zhu. So they will help each other when there's problem. 
This was the Kampong spirit in action, the camaraderie of friends and strangers alike. They would come to fill their stomachs and ended up making friends. Last Time Hawker is a place that they exchange information, talking about news, when people meet, when they meet down there. So, uh, because last time, like, to have phone, TV, lesser, this kind of information. Those good food will be very clouded. So by, by the time they, when they go there, they're waiting. So they start to check. Because they normally is neighbor, so they will, they will see each other every time. Che's father has since retired, but the bonds forged over many a bowl of noodles remain. Today, it is Che that wields the ladle at the stall after a trial by fire under his father's stern, watchful eye. He's a very strict person and short temper. So when we are young, we start to helping out on his hawker store. Uh, we are very scared actually, because when he teach us, he will just stand beside and see. Once you do wrong, he will start necking at you. And you have to follow 100% the way he did. You cannot change at all. So we learn things in a hard way and in a perfect way. See? So after thinking, yeah, because of, because of he, we can manage this store well now. While some old ways and distant connections remain, despite the changing times, there are places of the past that needed to be sacrificed in the name of progress. Yet these are kept alive in the memories of Singaporeans, young and old. Saya Asia Venti Usin, bekas penduduk Pulau Berani, umur 76. Duduk Pulau Berani selama 30 tahun lah. Sejak saya umur 2 tahun, saya datang Pulau Berani selama umur 2 tahun lah mak bapak saya bawa. In the 1960s, Pulau Berani was home to about 500 Malays and Chinese. Di Pulau Berani banyak kemudahan lah. Ada wayang, ada klinik kecil, ada kedai-kedai, ada pasar kecil, pasar sikit saja. Balai rakyat ada banyak British Army sana. Nah, British Army termasuk suami saya lah seorang. Islanders lived in four kampongs across Pulau Brani, which in Malay means Island of the Brave. Most of them served with the British military stationed at this offshore island. Tahun 57, suami saya datang daripada Nisun kena tukar di Singa, di Pulau Berani lah. Masa itulah saya kenal dia. Dia kerja dekat dengan tempat saya tinggal tu. Masa tu saya duduk rumah kuartus Ami dengan bapa saya. My father always, you know, walk around that place where the Army quarters are there. So when you always walk there, you always, you know, try to peep here, peep there. Oh, this girl is beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's when I meet the eye. And uh, that's how love uh, develop. Uh, it's not only, actually, it's not only my father. La. Most of the islanders, you know, uh, married with the British Army personnel. For the islanders, the British Army is the the most sought after to make as a husband. 
because of their work you know uh, unlike if your uh, other villagers uh, fishermen you know where they cannot have a certain future very handsome my dear uh, what handsome <laughs> Madam Asya's life on Pulau Brani would come to an end in 1971 when construction of a military naval base began. The island she once called home was officially declared off limits. Masa dapat tahu kita nak kena pindah rasa sedih jugaklah. Tapi jualan cakap kita tak boleh tak nak kita terpaksa kena pergi juga. Tapi lama juga saya fikirlah apa tu macam masih sayang nak tinggal Pulau Berani. Teringat banyak peristiwa saya kat sana lah dengan suami dengan mak keluarga keluarga semua. Masih berat hati juga nak keluar nangis juga nak keluar. Masa nak pindah, nangis, tinggalkan rumah semua tu. Kita tak banyak bawa barang masa tu. Sikit aja kan? The move from kampong homes set in nature to concrete flats in multi-story buildings set within the nation's sprouting public housing estates was for many a difficult transition. Rented house is very small, so the tendency to feel unsecured is there lah. During that period, you know, during the we want to move out because we did not know how we want to how we can survive in the mainland. Over time, the conveniences that came with the move eventually helped one-time kampong dwellers settle in but longings for the good old days still linger. Masa si kita dah keluar pada Pulau Berani, rasa rindu jugalah nak pergi Pulau Berani. Tapi tak boleh masuk lah masa tu ni. Saya tengok daripada Sentosa je. Kalau pergi Sentosa, nampak sikit pun. Jadilah dapat dia tengok sikit jadilah. One of the realities new flat dwellers had to contend with was space, or rather, the lack of it. And as Yo Hong Eng discovered, there simply wasn't enough space to store all of the past. My grandfather was, um, I would say, her belly that he studied herbs um, on his own, and then he also wrote a lot of books. And uh, my father moved many of the books to the flats. But of course, in Chinese, I do not know how to read Chinese. And then, unfortunately, I, the flat was so overcrowded, so I threw some of them away. And they moved them away. And when I became adult, then I realized that, hey, I have thrown away some treasures from my grandfather. <laughs> Resettlement was more than just saying goodbye to the old. It also meant adjusting to the new. Retired teacher Yo Hong Eng remembers moving out of his childhood kampong home. Yes, some of these kampong folks have never entered a lift before. They saw you know, people entering the lifts and then they were quite curious and waited. An old man entered the lifts. After quite some time, he saw the lift door close. And then after a while, the lift door opened and the young lady came out really had the shock of his life. So how come an old man entered the lift and then transformed into a young lady, you know, behind the door? Oh, he was really terrified of her. He said, I don't want to be in such a situation. <laughs> Resettlement, while difficult, brought progress. Hong Eng doesn't deny this, but as a collector of heritage memorabilia, he also believes that out with the old, in with the new, isn't always a good thing. I like to let the young people know that those things were made, were actually made with 
people with passion, people with skills, and people with uh, they put a whole heart and mind uh, to make the particular object. The value of preserving the old isn't lost on all young people. 25-year-old Sean Chum feels the same way about physical spaces. People often think of history as something that is dead, something that is in the past. Uh, and if you look at a kind of abandoned building, it's, you don't really see the life in it. You don't really see what could have happened in it. Uh, all you see is just piles of rubble or bricks, decaying wood. Uh, and what I really wanted to do was try to bring life uh, through stories. So using my body as kind of a medium to kind of tell stories and kind of bring life into the place again to show people what life was like or what life could possibly be like in those days. Sean is an artist. He began his exploration of Singapore's past with a series of artistic selfies taken in 50 old and abandoned spaces each one forgotten by the history textbooks and overlooked by mainstream media. This entire kind of interrogation of the history of Singapore was uh, called Yester Yes, and that kick-started because my grandparents were being uh, relocated. They were affected by the Selective on Block Redevelopment Scheme. And so the entire idea of you know, shifting houses, living behind uh, your home and living behind a piece of your memory, uh, and moving to somewhere new, the entire idea of like, uh, what do you remember and how do you remember really kind of inspired me to start on these kind of personal art projects. History is not your big narratives. Uh, not everyone can relate to these big narratives. Uh, while it is easy to, to frame these big narratives because they are key events that you know, shape a nation and shape a country, not many people can you know, have the same kind of, uh, kind of relationship to these histories. Uh, there are many other smaller personal histories that are equally relevant, equally valid, and also form that idea of a narrative, form that bigger Singapore story. These more humanist, more personal stories are something that uh, transcends time and something that even people in the present, people in the future can relate to. As the 60s came to an end, Singapore, just five years independent, was looking forward with anticipation to the next decade, a decade of getting things done and growing and finding an authentic Singapore voice. The 70s would be the decade the lion roared and the world took notice.